Good day, friends. Always good to be able to share God's Word with you. And we're in part five of our Jonah series. It's the part of the story where, where Jonah now is beneath the waves. He's in the belly of a fish, but you still see this imagery of his life descending down and down and down and down until he hits absolutely rock bottom. And you might be thinking, well, that's my story. My life just appears to be spiraling down and down and getting darker and darker. Maybe you feel like you're at the end and you've hit absolutely rock bottom. Well, this is an amazing part of the story for you to lean into with faith. Jonah discovers some incredible truths beneath the waves. But it's at this part of the story where there's a turning point. It's pivotal for him. And his life turns around and he begins to ascend through the waters of life and ascend in faith. And if you lean in with faith, it could be a turning point for you. It could be a pivotal moment in your life where you now begin to come out from the bottom and begin to ascend. But, but we must realize with Jonah here, as we learned last week, it's not just when we hit rock bottom. It's not just when we hit the bottom and now we wait for ourselves to ascend. Jonah didn't begin to ascend in faith when he hit rock bottom. But Jonah began to ascend in faith and through the waters of life and began to rise when he prayed at the bottom. And in this prayer at the bottom, in the belly of a fish, he comes to three realizations which he discovers. And these three realizations will resonate with many of you because this is what it sounds like to be woken up by God. Shall we read? I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Shoal I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me, all your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. What Jonah is beginning to realize in the belly of the fish as he hits rock bottom is that life without God is futile. It is pointless. Jonah is in a state of hopelessness and total despair. Some of us might look at this and think, well, that's severe. But what we need to realize is this is what it takes to wake Jonah up. What we need to realize is this is what it takes to wake some of us up out of our slumber of death and our downward spiral, even though at times we might not even realize that we are descending. God would want to intercept that descent and cause you to rise to be seated in heavenly places, to awaken you to the kingdom of God and eternal life. This is what it takes to wake some of us up. This might resonate with some of you. For some of us, it's quite dramatic. It might be a broken marriage where you're hanging on by a thread of a thread. It might be a bad health report, which suddenly has just shocked your system and you've realized your need of eternal life. For others of us, it might be an addiction which started off as ecstasy and felt like absolute freedom. But now this addiction has got hold of you, it's got its claws into you and it's dragged you into a pit of total destruction where you cannot see a way out and you are unable to overcome it by your own strength. Maybe for some it's just a rising tide of financial debt where you're feeling like you're on your last breaths and about to be consumed and go under. Sometimes... This is what it takes to wake us up, to, to turn us toward our dependency and trust in God and not rely on our own schemes and resources to ascend in life. 
and to unite us back to God. For others of us, it might not be that dramatic. But maybe there's this overarching dullness, deadness, purposelessness in your life where you're struggling to find meaning in your life. And, and so, so you, you, you consume your mind with a whole lot of mind-numbing activities, looking for purpose and, and meaning in life, just staring at a screen. And the, and the screen is 42 inches, but that gets boring, so you buy a 54-inch. But that now gets boring, so you need high-definition, X-definition, and it needs to be curved. But just numbing your mind, or perhaps you're just scrolling, scrolling and scrolling. And the content's not even that great. The content doesn't enrapture you. It doesn't invigorate you. It, it, it doesn't inspire you in any way. But you just find yourself mind-numbingly scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. What it really is, if you had to ask yourself the question, it's just the comfort of the escape, isn't it? For many of us, that's all we do. We just numb our minds and staring at screens and scroll after scroll after scroll, just escaping we, we just enjoy the comfort of the escape, isn't it? You see, for some it's dramatic, for some it's just an overarching deadness in our lives. But, but God wants to wake us up out of our slumber. And this is what he does with Jonah, is he begins to wake Jonah up out of his slumber. What we need to understand here is these are seasons of despair, despondency, anguish where we're, we're questioning and we might feel a note of despair in our lives but what we need to understand is 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 that true repentance amazing grace and our true ascent in life and in faith begins with a note of despair but God never ever leaves us there John Newton wrote an amazing song called amazing grace and there's a line in this song where he says, it was grace that taught my heart to fear. Hang on a second. Grace taught my heart to fear. But then the sentence doesn't end there. It says, it was grace that taught my heart to fear, but it was grace my fears relieved. You see, it was grace that led him to a moment of despair where then all of a sudden grace could now relieve that despair. You see, grace wakes us up. And it needs to wake us up before it can lift us up. These are moments in our lives which are just seasons of despair. But these are moments in our lives which we can truly embrace because it's a moment when God is turning our lives around and, and, and intervening in our lives, waking us up. We need to embrace these moments because it's through these moments they are gateways to new life. You see, Jonah in this season undoubtedly felt abandoned by God and hopeless, hopelessness was just surrounding him. But God hadn't abandoned him. In fact, it was where God was doing his most profound and deepest work in the life of Jonah. And it's often in these seasons in our lives that we find God and we look back on these seasons where God has done his most wonderful work. You see, God didn't have Jonah in a death chamber. God had him in a hospital for his soul, and God was doing his deepest work. God, in his commitment to you, is very thorough. He is a wonderful, great physician, an amazing surgeon who works in the depths of our hearts and at times will restore our soul at a deep, deep level. We need to embrace these seasons, these moments, because they are the gateway to new life. Look at what Jonah says next. He begins to celebrate. You brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. You see, his ascent is beginning. You brought my life up. He's beginning to celebrate, but hang on, hang on, hang on. You brought my life up from the pit. Isn't he still in the belly of the fish? Yeah, he is. Is that the pit? Is that the real pit, the belly of a fish, that circumstance, that bad circumstance? No, you see, Jonah has come to a realization of what the real pit in his life is. The real pit and the dark place of our lives and his life is not the bad circumstance. The real pit is his separation from God. God has brought him up out from the pit, which is a separation from God and united 
with him. He is reconciled with God and he is beginning to celebrate in spite of his bad circumstance being in the belly of a fish. You see, Jonah comes to this realization that it's better to be united with God in the belly of a fish than to be separated from God on dry land. And it's in the next verse we discover our second amazing realization that Jonah comes to. It's right in the middle of this book. There's 24 verses before it and 23 verses after it. It's in the very heart of the book. Pay attention to this verse. Verse 8. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Now you might be thinking, well, that's not relevant to me. I don't, I don't worship idols. I don't have a, a crafted little wooden figure which I bow down to in my, like a fat little guy in my back pocket which I bow down to. I don't have a totem pole in my garden. So this whole idol business is not relevant to me. I beg to differ, friends, because an idol is anything, anything that you crave, depend on, trust in, or delight for other than God. That word worship comes from the two words, worth-ship. It's something that we attract, attach weighty, worth to. And, and how do we identify the idols in our lives? Well, can you imagine anything, anything in your life that, 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 that you've attached such worth to? That something that you can't imagine living without is how you begin to discover these idols in your life. You see, for Jonah, he had a status as a prophet with Israel, and it was also Israel's prosperity. God asked him to do something that threatened his status as a prophet and the prosperity of Israel, was to go and extend mercy to Nineveh, Israel's enemies. That threatened his status and the prosperity of Israel. And because it threatened the thing that he so dearly loved and found his identity in, it caused him and it affected his obedience to God and he moved in the other direction. You also see with Jonah that he holds on to his hatred towards the Ninevites. He doesn't want to let go. It's a weird thing in us humans, isn't it? Is we like to hold on to the hatred of others who've treated us in, an, in a horrible or unjust way where we feel that they deserve to be hated. And Jonah doesn't want to let go of his hatred and he doesn't want God to touch that area of his heart where he can now extend mercy and love and grace to the people he oh so hates. Are there people in your life where you're holding on to hatred toward them and you don't want to allow God to touch that area of your heart so you withhold it from him? Because you know that when he touches this area of your heart, is you will extend mercy and grace and love towards the people you hate. You see, when we hold on to hatred like Jonah, it infects our entire soul. The bitterness is just like poison, which destroys us on the inside. And Jonah is holding on to the hatred. Are you holding on to hatred for anyone? Will you allow God just to touch this area of your heart so that you can extend mercy? And Jonah begins to feel the grace of God touch his heart in this area. So what is it for you? What is it for you? What is that one thing that you value so much that you attach great worth to that you can't imagine living without? Is it your career? Is it, is it a substance? Is it a lifestyle? Is it money? These things that you attach great worth to. Jeremiah, the prophet, would write that we as people, God's people, have, have forsaken the steadfast love of God, the fountain of all life. And we've, we've, we've made for ourselves and dug for ourselves systems which are broken in this world. Systems which, which cannot hold water. Where, where they fill up one day, but you come back the next day and it's just empty. 
and we, we've made for ourselves systems, careers, lifestyle, money, perhaps it's romance, a person, whatever it may be, where we try and find satisfaction and fulfillment in these systems. But we come the next day and we find that they're empty because they cannot hold any water. And Jeremiah would write, why, 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 why would we forsake the fountain of love, the steadfast love of God for broken systems? For Jonah teaches us that when we chase after these things, these broken systems of careers, romance, substances, uh, money, lifestyles, when, when, we, when we chase after these broken systems, we forsake and we forfeit the steadfast love of God. Why would we do that? Because it's the steadfast love of God that we are so built for. That is what we are made for, is to be reunited with God and to receive his steadfast love why would we forsake this amazing love of God that is so vibrant so experiential so effectual and so satisfying for our lives for these broken systems you see we get duped by the devil to chase after these things to think that we could find satisfaction fulfillment and love in these but what we find is when we come to them day after day it just leads to emptiness. They are empty. There was a CEO of Forbes magazine, or in the Forbes magazine. He wrote a story about how he had been climbing the ladder of success his whole life. He had been seeking success and prosperity. He had worked and put all his efforts into climbing this ladder. Only when he got to the top, he had discovered it had been ringing, leaning on the wrong building. You see, for you and I, friends, that's a, a little parable just to remind us. We might be putting all our energy and efforts into something that is leaning on the wrong building. Are you leaning into Christ and Christ alone? The last thing Jonah discovers in this amazing prayer but with a voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay to you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah's third great realization is that salvation belongs to the Lord. You see, Jonah comes to the realization whenever we realize something's wrong with us or we hit these seasons of despair, the first thing we try and do is fix it. We try and fix it. So we, we adopt religion and we try and fix this ourselves. But he comes to the realization, salvation belongs to the Lord. You see, there is a true Jonah, which this story is pointing us toward. Jesus, like Jonah, went into a season of great despair. Jesus, like Jonah, entered into the Garden of Gethsemane where he felt the weeds of sin begin to wrap around his head. He, he felt the bars of death begin to close in on him and the darkness roll in. He went to the cross and then from the cross he went down, down, down into the belly, into the depths of hell. And even when he was on the cross, he cried a prayer like Jonah did, except the difference with Jesus's prayer and Jonah's prayer. Jonah prayed and the Lord answered him. But there's only one reason why the Lord could answer Jonah in this moment. It's because the Lord never answered Jesus's prayer. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you and I could be heard. And God hears our cry because he didn't respond to the cry of Jesus because he took all our sin and he entered into the belly and the heart of hell so that we could be heard by God. And when Jonah's in the belly of the fish, Note in the midst of those verses, he looks to God's holy temple. He looks to the temple. He looks to the mercy seat of God where blood had been sprinkled all over, where sacrifice had been made so that he could be accepted and could talk and commune with God. We like Jonah are to look to the holy temple, 
the cross, the place of amazing sacrifice on our behalf so that we could be united with God and God can hear our cry in our moments of despair. You see, salvation belongs to the Lord. We're not to try and fix it ourselves. Our first point is to be reunited with God through the salvation that Jesus offers you and I. This is truly an amazing gospel. In your moment of despair, in your life in this moment, do you see those three things, these three foundational truths of repentance? That life without God is futile, it's pointless. That pursuing things other than God to try and find satisfaction and fulfillment only leads to emptiness. They are broken systems. Find your fulfillment and your satisfaction and your joy in God. Depend on Him wholly. Let Him be the foundation of your life. And receive receive the salvation of God that is offered in the cross of Jesus Christ. Look to the holy temple. Look to the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the true one who offers the gift of eternal life. In so doing, you'll begin your ascent in faith and your ascent in life.